Today we're celebrating episode three of AmateurLogic.tv. I must say, George, I like your style. Thank you, Jim. Ah, fine grape. Yeah. Would you like a little more? Suits my palate perfectly, yes, thanks. <laughs> that was tough to work feet over. <laughs> we have a special use for this can today. That's right. We're going to make a cantina. And not just any cantina. This one's got a little twist from the rest. We call this one the active cantina. George, what makes this, uh, first of all, I guess I should say, what basic frequency and what basic use are we going to be using this cantina for? Okay, just like everyone else's, this is going to be a Wi Fi cantina to help improve the performance of your Wi-Fi setup when you're uh, at the house and need to borrow a little Wi-Fi or in a motel room or just out doing your general everyday packet sniffing. Yeah. yeah. They really come in handy. They're highly directional. Tell me a little bit about this particular can, Tenna George. I notice uh, this can is bigger. This is a grape juice can. Welch's. <laughs> and the reason I chose Welch's um, no particular reason. Uh, we figured y'all would know what it was. So. <laughs> no, the, uh, this is a specific size of can. It actually, these work out better when it comes to making a cantina than a Pringles can does. You'll get better gain and uh, ah. actually a little easier to work with than the Pringles style as well. A little more durable too. A little isn't more it? durable. Now, there are a few differences to this cantina than your normal cantina. You know, normally you've got to have a Wi-Fi car that's got an antenna connector on it. Right. Yeah, and there's problems with that. Uh, yeah, there are. There's uh, pigtail problems. There are uh, RF loss problems, Yeah. just to name a couple. And that's the main one I was getting at is the RF loss. 2.4 gigahertz is a fairly high frequency. And Absolutely. when you hook a coaxial cable to it, you're going to have a lot of signal loss in that cable, much more than you would down on radio frequencies uh, like the standard broadcast. So you're uh, naturally limited as to how long that pigtail can be going to your cantina. Very true. I think uh, a lot of the industry standards, I say standards, de facto industry standards, you see some 12-inch pigtails out there, 19-inch pigtails out there. But I have seen some long ones, but, boy, that's really stretching it. Yeah. So there's a better way to do this, and that's what we're going to look at today. You're going to need a few things. You're going to need your Welch's grape juice can. You're going to need an Altoids can. And you're going to need a Linksys Wireless G USB network adapter. Or similar. Doesn't have to be this exact model. Doesn't have one. to be the exact model. Now, what we're going to do is create the active cantina. We're uh, essentially going to take the grape juice can, cut it, mount our uh, element inside of it just like we would a regular cantina that was going to have a pigtail run to it. That's where it gets different. We're going to take this USB device. This is the network card and everything, the antenna and all in one uh, convenient package that just plugs into the USB connector on your computer. So we'll actually be taking the antenna off of this and connecting the little short one inch pigtail here to our element ah. inside the cantina. So essentially, we have no signal loss due to cable. Very, very none. Bad. Negligible. Um, then all we got to have is uh, this. We plug it in with the little six-foot cable that comes with it, and we can get six feet away. Mm. Or you could get like an 18-foot extension USB cable and get uh, 20 foot away or better. But if you really want to stretch out, then probably what you want to get 
is one of these uh, USB adapters that uses Cat5 oh. cable. Then you can put your antenna 150 feet away from your computer. <laughs> wow. Now we're talking about being able to get up and get some real height or aim at um, access points that you couldn't yeah. normally see. Covert. That's what first came to my mind. 150 feet, your antenna can be in one place and you can be safely hidden in another. And there'll be absolutely no signal loss. Yeah, that's the best part. And you couldn't do this with a regular antenna. So without any further ado, let's, let's get, get to it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, step one, drink the grape juice. <laughs> We're going to be building an active cantina today out of a Welch's grape juice can. And to help me with that project, we're going to introduce Mike McLemore, who's our ace cameraman. Hi. Hi, Mike. Hi. Thanks for visiting with us today. Sure. And I guess the first thing we're going to have to do is pick out the Welch's can here. And we've already drank it. <laughs> we've got to cut the top now. So let's get started. All right. So we'll open the can with the can opener. The next thing we we'll want to do is wash the grape juice out of the can. Okay, at this point uh, we're going to have to determine where we need to put the hole in the can um, for the element. And um, using the uh, calculations uh, with the calculator provided by turningpoint.net, now there are several uh, websites that will have these same types of calculators, but we're just happening to use the one uh, from turningpoint.net, uh, using that calculator uh, using the uh, dimensions of the can, which we came up with a uh, four and a quarter inch diameter can. Um, the calculator tells us that we need to put our hole uh, approximately 1.63 inches, which we said was about one and five eighths inches, from the bottom of the can. Um, so we'll take our ruler here, and um, I'm going to go on the opposite side from where the uh, label was on the can here, just so we'll have a nice clean surface to work with. And measuring up from the bottom of the can, our um, 1 and 5 eighths inch mark is approximately right here. And I'm going to put a small mark on the can there. And um, then we're going to, before we attempt to drill our hole, uh, I'm going to use a, a punch or some type of a pointed device to just to make a small divot in the can so that our uh, drill bit won't crawl when we attempt to drill the hole. What we're going to be mounting is a BNC connector, uh, and we purchased this one from Radio Shack. Um, this just happens to be a BNC jack um, that's it's a, like a panel mounted jack. It's a uh, UG1094 uh, uh, Radio Shack part number. 278-105. We're going to use a little bit smaller bit first. All right, that's our pilot hole. Now we're going to use our uh, larger bit that we've determined is about the right size to mount our BNC connector. We're going to use a uh, just a basic deburring tool here to dress the hole up just a little bit because we're going to have uh, some some sharp edges there that might cut your fingers while you're working around it there. Uh, so we're just going to take the deburr there and dress that hole just a little bit. Mike has prepared the can. Now I'm going to prepare the BNC connector. This has got to be modified a little bit because we're not using it as a connector. We're actually using it as a uh, standoff to hold the antenna element inside the can. So to do that, we're going to break off the outer edges where the BNC connector actually slips over the connector here. I'll take a pair of uh, needle nose pliers and a pair of diagonal cutters and we'll get started here. First thing I'll do is just just start breaking it away. So we've uh, trimmed down all the outside of the connector right near the flange area here on the inside. Uh, we can get this a little bit cleaner by using a file. Uh, 
The next thing we need to do is get the center conductor out of the B and C connector here because we're going to slide our element through there. We're going to try a punch and we're just going to try to punch it through. There we go. Now we've got a hole all the way through. Suitable for mounting the radial of our antenna. According to turningpoint.net, the correct length for our antenna element is 1.21 inches. And that calculates out to be 3.07 centimeters. So we'll clip our um, radial to the right length. First, though, we'll make sure that it's good and straight. We'll take a piece of straight wood here and a hammer and just make sure we get it flat. And we'll measure it and mark it. Actually, we don't need to mark. We're going to clip. So we'll lay it up here. There's three centimeters. We're going to 3.1. Just under 3.1 centimeters. And let's measure and see if we got the right length. Our element is exactly 3 centimeters, and we want it to be slightly longer than that, which is going to be real hard to cut with a pair of wire cutters. So what we're going to do is actually take a anvil, which is a piece of railroad iron here, and a hammer, and we're just going to kind of flatten one end here. Not completely flattened, but just we're spinning it as we hit. And this is going to make it a little stretched out to be a little bit longer and allow us to get more precise on the length. And I think we've nailed it. Now that we have our antenna element the correct length, it's ready to go. However, this is copper, and if you put copper outside, it's going to corrode over the years and turn green and tarnish. So rather than uh, have that, what I'm going to do here is apply a little bit of Cool Amp brand silver plating compound to this. And it'll actually put a little silver plating over this. Now Mac also suggests that you could tin this with some solder, some silver solder or, or lead solder as far as that goes. Just something to keep it from corroding out in the elements. Cool Amp is not something you're going to find locally. Well, we'll show its use anyway. We take a damp cloth and just a small amount of the powder. And we rub our wire on it. Now, this stuff is uh, highly toxic. So you don't want to breathe it. The piece of wire on the left is our element. It's been silver plated and the piece on the right is just bare copper. Now the heart of this project is the Linksys Wireless G USB network adapter. You can find these at CompUSA or sometimes even at Walmart. You can find them almost anywhere. They're around 50 bucks. Now you could use a different brand if you like, but we chose Linksys because it was readily available and we thought everyone could probably find this. Now the unit looks like this, about the size of a pack of cigarettes. And what we're going to do is take the printed circuit board and everything out of this little plastic housing. And we're going to mount it inside an Altoids box, which will give us shielding. And also could be sealed better if you wanted to leave this unit outdoors. So to start the disassembly process, there's one screw holding this together. And that's right here below the antenna, under this rubber foot. Peel that off. It's got a uh, star driver type of head in it, or Torx, I believe they may call that. You can use a uh, just a small screwdriver. will probably work in there. Remove the screw. Also, we're not going to need this mounting bracket. Now the unit has a uh, sticker right here. We'll want to take a razor blade and just cut right down the middle of it. Now we'll pull the unit apart. It just snaps together. Here's the printed circuit board. And there's the antenna. This unit also has a USB connector right here on the side. Now, 
to make this unit a little more robust, we're going to remove this connector and cut the uh, end off our cable and solder straight to the PC board here. You don't have to do that, but this is just going to make it more robust and reliable if you do leave this thing out in the elements. Now we'll take an X-Acto knife and open the antenna. Being careful not to cut our fingers, we'll just cut right down the seams of the plastic. All we need to do is get it started and then it'll pretty much snap apart after that. There's the original antenna that's in the unit. You notice it's not the same length as our element here. And that's probably because this is not just a straight dipole. I see some extra traces and stuff. Uh, been around here but we're not real concerned about that we'll be removing this piece of the antenna all we want here is the cable we're gonna get a little bit of uh, stuff here called solder wick and I believe you can still get this at Radio Shack or any electronic supply house will have it and what this does is it sucks the solder up off the uh, PC board as it becomes heated And we'll go to the other side. Now this side has the shell of the coax solder to it. There we go. Here's the cable that goes to the antenna. This is a coaxial cable. That means there's a center conductor, and then around that center conductor is insulation, and then around that is a uh, wire shield to shield interference uh, out of the cable also to help it maintain its impedance too. Now you can see the outer shield here is around the outside and then the center conductor is just right here in the center. You can barely see its insulation around the side. We will need to peel this back slightly so that we are able to solder it to our uh, new antenna elements. We want to uh, remove this connector from the PC board. There's four little uh, sort of connections here plus these two tabs on the side that are for mounting. To make our marks for the holes that we'll have to uh, put in the can, I'm going to lay the PC board on the bottom of the can here uh, with the coaxial lead for the antenna at the top up here because we're going to mount the uh, connector for the element uh, in this end of the box. So we're going to leave the, the board as far down this way as we possibly can. Since we're only going to use one mounting post, uh, I'm going to make the mark here at this end. I have my mark at this end of the box, and because this is a fairly thin metal, um, a, a drill bit would probably tear this up pretty bad if we were to try to use a drill to put a hole in that. So we're just going to use a punch. We're going to take this piece of wood here and put it underneath the uh, box just to give us a little support there. And I'm going to place the awl in the center of the hole there. And hopefully we'll be able to get a hole through that and into the wood. Now to hold the uh, PC board up off of the bottom of the can, we've got a little small riser here. This was probably salvaged out of uh, uh, another piece of equipment. Um, I think you can purchase things like this. In fact, you could probably get them from Radio Shack or anything that you could use to, um, to raise the circuit board up off of the bottom of the metal can. Um, uh, you, could, you could probably even use uh, a double-sided sticky tape uh, to, to do this. Now we'll place our circuit board in for a trial fit. We've got a little self-adhesive rubber foot here. Uh, these also, I think, can be purchased from Radio Shack or just about any electrical supply house. And we'll put that uh, somewhere that it's not interfering with a component. And the nut to go on top of the standoff. And as you can see, we're not touching any of the traces on this end of the board. 
Uh, we don't have any traces touching the metal at the top of the board there. The little rubber foot on the, by, on the back side of the board is holding it up off of the uh, surface of the metal there. And um, that should do nicely for mounting the, uh, the circuit board inside of our can. So we're going to take our circuit board back out of the can so that we can put another hole in for our uh, modified BNC connector that will hold the element. All right, we're going to mount our uh, our box that's going to hold the PC board to the can. And what we're going to do is take the BNC connector and mount it with the threaded end up through the can, like this, and then through the box on this end, like that. And then we will take the nut that goes on the end of the BNC connector, Give that a turn or two just to seat it down. Just about there. All right, that's got that mounted. That's one nice solid unit. Now we're going to determine the pinout of the USB connector so that we can wire the cable straight to the terminals on the PC board. First we'll cut off this end of the cable since we're not using it anymore. Okay, now we've stripped back all the wires. We'll get the connector. This uh, came right off of the PC board earlier. We removed it from right there. So we're going to position this just the same way as it would be on the PC board. Now we'll plug in the connector and it's just a matter of identifying which wires, which colors go to which pins here. Now the shield is usually connected to the outside and we've proven that Now that we know what the uh, wire colors should be to each pin, we'll strip our cable and proceed to sort it. The next thing we'll do is tin our wire. You'll notice that we've cut the green and the black a little bit shorter than the red and the white. That's because they're going to go to the bottom and the other two need to be long enough to come up around the top. Now we'll tin these leads so that uh, they'll be much easier to solder to the board. Before we solder it to the board, here's a, one place that things could go wrong. We need to make certain that we punch a hole in the Altoids can for the USB cable to come through. And we'll do that on the back side of the can here so that our wire can, can come away from uh, the mouth of the antenna. Now we'll make the hole just large enough for the cable to slip through. Now we'll make our solder connections. We'll tin the board here on the solder pad so that they'll be ready. But we won't put so much solder there that we short these together. Each one is a separate connection and if you get solder between any two of them you've got a problem. First we'll do the black. We want to double check it just to make sure that we have no solder bridges between any of the uh, junctions here. All that looks good. Now we'll pull the shill up through the hole. Now we've got uh, the USB cable soldered directly to our PC board.
And now for the really fun part, we need to mount the antenna element to the BNC connector inside the can. It's not really a BNC connector any longer, it's more of a standoff now. And the reason we chose a BNC connector is because it was readily available and we knew that it had an insulator just about the right size to hold our element. We need to do a little more prep work on the connector. Although I really hesitate to do so, it looks like it's necessary to remove the coaxial lead from the network card because the cable is so short there's no way to make the connections inside of our can. We're going to wrap another piece of wire around there so that we can get a ground connection just off the side of this. I just grabbed some ordinary stranded cable and I'm going to get out one of the individual strands. Now we'll wrap this right around the shield and this is what we've got. Now we'll put a little solder right here and we'll also tend the wire out a little bit too. Clip it about that long. This is the end of the BNC connector that's going to be inside. We need to drill a little hole right here at the bottom of the insulation to pull our new shield through, our ground lead, and solder it right here to the edge of the connector. But before we solder it, we'll need to extend it all the way through and solder our radial first then pull it all back down, then we can attach the solder there. A regular drill and bit is probably a little large, so you might want to take something like a needle or a pin and heat it up, and then use that to make a hole with. So I'm going to start by folding the wire like this. Now at this point we can solder our element of the antenna right to the tip. I just want to solder the tip here to our element. We're ready to proceed with pushing the element into the BNC connector or what is now a standoff. And as we do that we need to be careful to pull our shield along with it. Now we've got the element mounted inside of the BNC connector standoff. You can see right here is where the ground lead came through. That was attached to the shield and soldered right here to the outside of the connector. Now the process of soldering here heated up the BNC connector and caused the plastic to shrink slightly. I don't like the slack that it has there so I'm going to put just a tiny dab of hot glue all the way around. I'm going to stay as far away from up here at the radial as I can. Now. To make sure that the glue had a chance to stick, this is pretty slick plastic. I've taken a razor blade and I've scratched the sides of it to make it a little bit rough. And we'll apply just a small amount around the bottom. I don't know how conductive hot glue is at 2.4 gigs. And that's why I'm keeping it as far away from the element as possible. Now our antenna element is very fragile sitting in this mount. Uh, there's perhaps better ways to do this, um, but I was going for the highest gain possible, which meant putting as little distance as I could between the element and the end of the coax. So I wanted to have as much wire as possible here remaining inside the shield in order to maintain the impedance all the way to the element. Now, we want to make certain that in the process of installing all that, that I didn't short the element to ground anywhere through uh, either the connector or through the shield. 
And touching in here with the ohm meter shows I didn't. The ohm meter is on. Let's just make sure that we do have conductivity all the way, and we do, all the way through the center conductor. So now we're ready to install it. Okay, there we go. Now it's time to mount our board back inside and to reattach the coax to it. We've got it in the can now. It's time to close the box. Now if we want to, we can put a strain relief right here. Now our cable can't pull through the box. Now if this is going to be left outdoors in the elements, then it would be a good idea to seal it a little better. You might want to put a little uh, silicon caulk in here, and you might want to put a little around the edge of the lid, and particularly right here where the door hinges are, and then close it shut. And here's the finished product, our active antenna. Just plug it into the notebook and we're ready to go. Now, if you're going to be using this outdoors, and this might be a good idea anyway, because your hands get sweaty and contain salt, and they'll cause this can to rust, or if it gets wet. So it would probably be a good idea to paint it either with some type of protective spray, uh, clear coat, or a solid color if you like. Same thing with the outdoors box. You will want to put some masking tape or something around the element before doing this so that you don't get paint on it or the insulator around it. Okay, that was a super project, George. Thanks, Jim. I had a lot of fun building that one. Yeah, and now the testing. Yeah, that'll be fun. Maybe, maybe next episode. Sounds good to me. I look forward to it. And now what have you got on this week's website roundup? A lot of interesting sites. I think uh, our viewers will be pleased to see what we've come up with. Welcome back, Website Roundup fans, for another episode. I'm Jim Burrell, hosting for Amateur Logic. Let's get right to it. First, George is going to carry us on a tour of a little technical entertainment. Thanks, Jim. My website pick for this episode is techtainment.net, who bill themselves as entertainment for geeks. Now, the home page is where you'll find all the latest listings of tech videos and podcasts available. This is the first place I check daily for new shows to download. One thing I like about this site is the promptness of their listings. It's always up to date. And I also like the fact that it's all about tech. I don't have to scroll past a lot of listings of home movies and porn videos. At Techtainment, you go straight to the best tech content that the web has to offer. The Techtainment directory is broken into easy to navigate tabs where you find all your favorite shows. The Techtainment Forum allows you to discuss topics of interest with other IPTV viewers as well as IPTV producers. And the bottom left corner of the page, what's currently in beta, is displayed. I really like the site-wide tagging, where there are many links to interesting shows and people all in one place. Techtainment.net. Now that's entertainment for geeks. Thank you very much, George. Now, on to Tommy's pick for this website roundup. I think Tommy's carrying us on a trip to a free software repository. Thanks, Jim. Uh, for the roundup this round, <laughs> I want to talk about uh, an open source software repository site called freshmeat.net. Everyone loves something free, especially free software. I know I do. And freshmeat.net gives you a handy place to go and find any packages that are available. With the way the open source movement is today in the software industry, if there is a commercial package out that, you, that you're interested in, there's almost surely going to be an open source alternative available that's just as good and sometimes better that's available for free on the Internet. Back to the site itself. The site's uh, clean, the way it's laid out, concise. 
uh, on the main part of the page, you will see the projects in chronological order that they were either submitted or updated on. Um, on the right-hand column of the page, you've got security bulletins that are generally related to open source packages that you may be using. So if you're using open source already, this is a good place to come and see if there are any security issues you know, and patches that you may need to get. Um, also, there's a list of the most popular projects. Uh, the latest releases based on the day of the week. Uh, it goes back several days. Uh, there's also uh, a section at the bottom on the right hand column for hot topics on a couple other sites like uh, Security Focus, NewsForge, and Slashdot. Um, so you can get a lot of information here on the one page. Let's say, for instance, maybe we want to start a podcast. You're always going to need an audio editor for a podcast. So we'll search in audio editor, put audio editor in the search box, uh, rather, hit enter and 37 projects come up and I see my favorite one right there uh, Audacity, that's a really nice package it, uh, it rivals a lot of the commercial packages and there are quite a few other ones as well I'm sure they're just as good so if you need some software and need a place to go look for it try freshmeat.net I think you'll find it a pretty interesting site I use it quite often myself thank you Tommy very well done I'll remember that now let's see what kind of pick I was able to drum up for this episode. Hello, my pick this week for Website Roundup makes for an interesting story. It's about a bunch of computer types who sit down around a table to have lunch and talk about mapping the internet. Ultimately, the conversation led to one chap making the claim that he could map the entire internet in just one day with a program that he could write. Thus was born the Opti Project. Opti comes from the Latin root word that we get optical from, except that Opti in this case is spelled with an E. Opti.org is more, though, than just a geek maps internet site. Opti is also about art. There are lots of interesting images. Have a look. These images have so much detail that they really can't be appreciated until you begin to zoom in and poke around. Here's a little animation to give you a quick idea. This video shows a zoom in to a particular host on the internet and back out. Now here's the best news. Opti.org is an open source project, which means you can download the source code for free and map the internet yourself. Pretty interesting, huh? Thanks for watching. I'm your host, Jim Burrell for another episode of Amateur Logic's Website Roundup. Great Website Roundup this episode, Jim. Thanks, George. I had a lot of fun putting that together. I can see you did. <laughs> well, I'm looking forward to our next segment. Yeah, let's check in with Tommy now and see what he's into this episode. Hi, I'm Tommy. Welcome to Photo Tips on AmateurLogic.tv. We're going to be going over some common uh, tips and tricks, techniques related to digital photography, whether you use a point-and-shoot camera or a digital SLR. Some of the tips and techniques that we're going to go over will actually be applicable. That's a tongue twister. Applicable to film uh, photography as well, but we're going to mainly be focused on digital. One of the common problems that we normally run across is a white balance problem. That's probably the most common issue. If you've ever taken a picture inside and noticed that it has an orange or yellowish cast, generally that's because the camera didn't compensate or wasn't set properly for the white balance of the lighting in the room. Uh, in, interior lighting generally uh, uses incandescent or tungsten bulbs and that's that light usually gives off uh, an orange or reddish cast. To, to get a color balanced picture, you need to compensate for that in the camera. Uh, a lot of cameras have automatic white balance compensation built into them, but they don't generally, uh, well, I almost hesitate to say that, some of them don't generally work very well 
especially if you have mixed lighting. Say, for instance, you've in your kitchen area, you may have um, fluorescent lighting, and in the dining room area, you may have uh, tungsten, and somewhere in the middle, the light is mixing, and the white balance compensation has a hard time dealing with that sometimes. So if, you, if you've ever had pictures that didn't look quite right with the color balance, we're going to go over a couple of easy techniques that you can use to adjust that and make your pictures look more normal. Today we're going to focus on using some open source software to do our white balance adjustments. The software is called the GIMP. A lot of you are probably familiar with it. The GIMP is an open source package. It's freely available on the web. Um, you can download it and it doesn't cost you a thing and, and it rivals a lot of the higher end professional packages in the output. Um, some people find the interface a little bit clunky but uh, that's neither here nor there. Let's go on to our example. Here I've taken the same image with three different white balance settings on my camera. On the bottom left I had the white balance set to auto the top left I had it set to tungsten and the top right I had it set to outdoors or daylight and what we're seeing here is that the auto on the bottom left did not quite, didn't quite make the grade when it was trying to compensate for the lighting um, it was close but it, but it didn't quite make it the top left is the closest where I actually set it for the correct color temperature the correct white balance which was for the tungsten lighting I was using and the top right um, I knew when we took the picture that it was going to be purposely off and you can see it's got quite a cast to it because it was set for daylight balance since the daylight image we took is the farthest off let's try to tackle it and uh, see if we can't get that white balance corrected I'm going to load it up in the GIMP and let's do some editing and see what we can do You have two tools in the GIMP that you can use. The first one we're going to try is the color balance. So it's under the tools menu, tools, color tools, and color balance will bring up the dialog. And you can see you have the range, uh, shadows, midtones, and highlights. You, this can be a little tedious as you have to adjust. So we, if we have too much yellow, we add a little blue and a little cyan till we get the color about where we want it. You're going to have to do this for the highlights, the midtones, and the shadows. You have the most control using this method, but it takes a lot of time. There are some built-in tools in the GIMP that will actually do this automatically for you if you know a white, uh, gray, or a black point in the image. And since I took the picture, I know that the white bound, the, I'm sorry, the background is supposed to be perfectly white. That method will, will actually work. It takes a lot of time and work, as I said, to make it, to make your image exactly right. Let's try a shortcut, which I think you'll find most useful, and, and I catch myself using it um, more times than using the color levels. We're going to go to the tools, tools menu, color tools again, and the levels dialog. We can pick from, we have the option of choosing a white point, a black point, a gray point, but we're going to stick with the white, like I said, since I know the background was white. If you take the eyedropper and click it on what was white, it does all the hard work for you and not a lot of that sliding around of the dialog, uh, of the sliders on the dialog, I mean. And uh, anyway, that's pretty much it. It's, it's uh, so simple. Download the GIMP from the URL below and give it a try on some of your images that may have a white balance problem. I'll, remember, always try to adjust your white balance for the correct lighting. Uh, refer to your camera manual and you'll get the best results but if you don't the GIMP can help you get those straightened out thanks for watching and uh, in some of the upcoming episodes for the photo tips we're going to be doing some moving to some techniques later we got a few more coming for software tweaks and then uh, we may try to do some bad weather photography and you know lightning photography things like that if the weather cooperate with us 
So uh, keep watching, and I uh, think you'll find some interesting and fun things coming up in the near future. That was a great segment, Tommy. Very informative. I really enjoyed it, too. I also enjoyed everything about the Active Cantina project. Yeah, uh, that was a lot of fun, too. And we look forward to trying it out maybe next episode. Yeah, in a future episode, to be sure. Well, that's it. That wraps us up for Episode 3. Episode 3. Y'all join us again for Episode 4. Probably in another month or so. See ya. In three. George, another fantastic project from the bench. Thanks, Jim. I always enjoy doing them. I love them, I tell you. Yeah, we appreciate everyone who viewed episode four with us today. Nice. This was episode three, so I don't <laughs> exactly know how you watched it. <laughs> I was just thinking, yeah. this is incredible, isn't it? <laughs>